Warning. The following podcast is utter nonsense and may cause agoraphobia, kleptomania, insomnia, and oppositional defiance disorder. We are required by law to provide you with this disclaimer for hazardous materials. Welcome back to Hazardous Materials. Have you taken your break today? I'm Gideon Gonzalez, and with me as always... Case Jones. So we're going to be doing a bit of a post-Hummus review of uh, Heroes Reborn, not the uh, the 90s comic event that inflicted this iconic Robert Liefeld artwork on us. Look at that breast line. Look at it. But no... A uh, a play instead on DC Rebirth, in which Jason Aaron asked the question, what if there were no Avengers and instead there was a Justice League? And I had a, I had a great time with it. I honestly thought this was going to be more of the same when I heard that this was going to come out. I thought, okay, great. This is Marvel sucking up to Liefeld again because they do that every once in a while. They throw him a bone. And give him work, and I hate it every time they do it. By the X Force 30th anniversary special in September, you'll have Don't do was that. it Major X, which is a character we will <laughs> never ever use unless Liefeld is forcing us to by writing him in, which he's in that cover. It's in that stupid yeah. 30th anniversary cover. So I largely ignored this, mm-hmm. uh, but then you said that you really liked it, and you tend to have decent taste. It's true, sometimes. <laughs> Many times, even. Uh, well, you, 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 okay. You're batting a thousand at the whole vision thing. The vision thing was good, mm-hmm. and that played I'm, heavily into WandaVision. I'm coasting on the success of my vision recommendation. To yeah, you. that was pretty good. That was that was pretty good. So, what do you think about Here's Reborn? Uh, uh, it was strangely satirical. It is, yeah. <laughs> I was not expecting that. I, I was, I mean, I'd kind of knew what I was getting into from how Jason Aaron had written the squadron in his Avengers run. So I was kind of prepped for. Uh... <laughs> now, here's the thing I'd never heard of this writer before. I had Jason no Aaron? I'd never heard of Jason Aaron's before. Wow. If I've read his stuff, I'm unaware of it. So I had no idea what style I was going in for here. Mm-hmm. And when when I was talking to you before we got started about the continuity issues, which I'm I'm talking of to artist, mm-hmm. I had to check back to make sure did this guy write both of these issues? And he did. We'll we'll get into that little nitpick here a little bit later. Um, so I mean, what what has this guy done before this? Jason Aaron. Is- <laughs> oh, this is funny. Jason Aaron is like one of the most. I'm not. I don't know if he's like. He's a pretty critically acclaimed writer. He's very beloved. He's written a ton of super high profile books like Thor, God of Thunder. He introduced the Jane Foster version of Thor. I'm not much of a Thor fan. Uh, he did Scalped over at Vertigo. She's Didn't really read that. good, really great book. Uh, obviously, he's been doing Avengers for about three years now, I want to say. I stopped reading Avengers when She Hulk got roided. Um, that was his run. Ah, uh, man, he's got a whole bunch. He was part of the writing crew for AVX. He wrote Wolverine and the X-Men, the school book. He did that entire series. Okay, I think I wrote he that. did Wolverine in Hell, which I assume you read because Sabretooth's in it. I read that, yeah, because mm-hmm. I was trying to figure out, okay, is this real hell? And if it is, is does that mean that Saber is really dead? <laughs> you know, there's all kinds yeah. of questions to be asked. So here is Reborn. Uh... We see the world through Blade's eyes. My boy is the only one who remembers. Of all the people in the Marvel <laughs> Universe, they chose Blade. And I love that at the end, he's even like, I don't know, maybe it's because I'm a vampire. Who knows? Yeah, they chucked it to him being a supernatural. And the funniest thing is he's like, and I'm walking through this world thinking, hmm, a world with no Avengers doesn't seem to have any vampires. So maybe it is better. <laughs> it's like, my boy. I love they do man. address that. I love the him. fact there's no vampires in there. But yeah, so you've got a uh, Captain America still frozen in the ice until Blade somehow gets up there and cracks about. You got a uh, Thor who is, and this was the funniest thing, and this listens to me, an atheist who hates hammers. <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, apparently Thor had uh, kind of slept through history. Yeah, he's just kind of been he's at like the a same... forgotten lightning uh, he's, thunder guy. He's just like chugging beers down in Asgard, not in Asgard even. He's just. Ranting and raving in Norway and being like, and sleeping oh, through World War II. Yeah, yeah, but you got a uh, Iron Man who's obviously just war criminal Tony Stark. 
Yeah, War Profiteer, Tony yeah. Stark, yeah. And meanwhile, uh, the world fights such threats as... And w- this feels like it came from a different pitch, because all the villains are also mashup villains. So you've mm-hmm. got Doctor Doom and the Juggernaut, who's kind of like a doomsday play. Yeah. And it seems like all the issues all talk about putting villains in different places. Well, when do you put them in the negative zone? No, we need to put them in Ravenloft. That's where they all go, or... No, they need to be locked up in this cosmic prison. Yeah. Executed later in, in nowhere. So they kind of drop different rogues galleries onto different squads of Supreme members. So Hyperion kind of gets a catch-all bag. He gets like Doc he gets Doctor Doom and Juggernaut mashed up into a doomsday play. You got the immortal Hulk as basically Bizarro. Who talks exactly like Bizarro. It was, it's very cute. Uh you've got Ultron's like a Brainiac take. Uh, the Annihilus Waves kind of like got a little bit of the Kryptonian criminals and Bottle City of Candor stuff. Uh, Nighthawk absorbs pretty much the entire Spider-Man mythos. With Batman. Yeah, exactly. And so, but weirdly enough, also fight, well, I guess because he's still a Spider-Man villain. Uh, in Heroes Reborn number one, he has to save uh, the Capitol building from the Black Skull, which is uh, Red Skull with the Venom suit. Yeah. Is pretty fun. Yeah, for you, huh? Uh, Power Princess absorbs Jason Aaron's Thor mythos and ha- has a very dark play on uh, classic Wonder Woman stuff. So you know how Wonder Woman is like a statue brought to life? Mm-hmm. Well, uh, Power Princess turns all of her enemies into statues. Yeah, and apparently she can switch them back and forth because yeah, she... sometimes you gotta interrogate Hercules. Yeah, a Hercules. Uh, yeah, hey, do you recognize this sound? It's like Thor's lightning, and he always does start laughing. I really liked uh, her rogues gallery, including Tigra, little cheetah joke, and uh, Janet Janet Van Dyne as the, the giantess. giantess. I was like, I like it. <laughs> Who is a playoff of uh, Giganta? Exactly, Super Friends icon. But yeah, so you've got the Scarred and Supreme doing their their business around the world, making space safe for Americans. This thing was so over the top in its patriotism. Yeah, it is. Um, I mean, like they're nationalist superheroes. They're super nationalist. I mean, it's like God and apple pie and the greatest uh, nation in the whole wide world and all this other stuff. I'm like, dang, yeah, every I forgot issue, how just cringeworthy uber patriotism is. Every issue is uh, kind of a spotlight issue for a different squadron member. Mm-hmm. And the second one with Hyperion opens with him being like, we need red-blooded American solutions as he flies through Galactus's head. Yeah. I was like, does that work? Is that how Galactus works? <laughs> I mean, Hyperion can do it. Well, Hyperion could do a lot of things. Uh, I really want to call attention to issue, I think it was three, which is the Blur story, mm-hmm. which is a really good self-contained speedster story where he has to learn how to, like, how to think and just act with this higher consciousness by going to the ancient one and learning like Dr. Strange style meditation. How to slow down. Exactly. I thought that was really cool. It was, it was some, it was somewhat a little hard to follow on that one because I couldn't tell if he'd lost his powers or he had lost his powers. Is he slowed down? Is he speeding up to slow down? It was just a train of thought on it was Mm -hmm. all over the place. And I will say, while I do love, pretty much the vast majority of the artists involved with working on this book. I really think having a different artist every issue really kind of hurt it cohesively. Because you mentioned there being continuity errors. Serious continuity issues. Um, like with uh, Goblin poking out his own eye, uh, which what was this. Mm-hmm. It was specifically this. But then the next issue, he's got this one bandaged. Or how uh, when Echo escapes Ravenloft, she fries a bald bullseye. Next issue, he's up and running with a crew cut. Like a phoenix. Yeah, you know. it's like he bounced back. And then the, the one that I wasn't so much concerned with is the fact that um, in the Siege side issue, mm-hmm. they killed Sabretooth at when they put Silver Witch in Ravenloft, but he's in Ravenloft with her. And that and could just very well be And Silver Witch also, I think, died in the Heroes Reborn number three fighting Blur. But she died like... Pretty much off camera. Yeah. Yeah. He had to describe how she died. Very bizarre. Yeah. But uh, <laughs> I, I really, I also really want to give special attention. I know you didn't like the art in it, but uh, the Nighthawk focus issue where you have uh, him kind of going through a lot of classic Spider-Man and Batman beats because like he's 
stopping a uh, a, an inmate breakout at not Arkham Asylum, Ravenloft, and you've got a Craven doing a Craven's Last Hunt bit at the beginning where he's running around in a Nighthawk costume. Now, I I will say that most of the issue was actually okay, and I didn't Mm -hmm. hate it. I didn't hate it until the Ravenloft escape, and I saw all the villains looking just like... Like Salvador Dali <laughs> painted them. Aaron Cooter, I, I love his art. He's got this very gnarly style, and he can make some uh, some pretty twisted portraits. I hate that. Actually, I need to double check. I, Aaron Cooter might have done the Power Princess one. but That was actually pretty decent. I remember the, the big page I remember from his issue was the... Uh, oh, no, it was issue six that Cooter did. Cooter did the final issue, because there's the Dark Squadron that... Uh, Norman Osborn puts together where it's the Sentry and Moon Knight and Valkyrie and Nova and oh, who was their speedster? They had Nova. They had because Nova was Green Lantern, Valkyrie was Wonder Woman, mm-hmm. Moon Knight was Batman, and Sentry was Superman. Yeah. Who did they have as a speedster? There's not. A he, lot was, of... he was. He was, he was, was it, standing off to the side. Was it North Star? It was a. It was a character that we'd already seen before. Oh, he was the. He was the. The Ghost Racer. Oh, yeah. It was Ghost Rider. Yeah. Because he was standing way off in the side. And I love me a good Dark Avengers callback. And it, recasting Green Goblin as the Joker, it's it's too easy. It's too obvious, but it, it, it was fun. Norman gets some good bits in. I, I, I enjoyed the part where they recognized that they were fighting Captain America, who mm-hmm. to them has been lost since World War II, and gets scooped up by the, the nascent Avengers. And they see him, and they're just so consumed with patriotism. The fact that he's wearing that outfit <laughs> makes them hesitate to hit him. Yeah, and the source of all of this is uh, our very own Phil Coulson, who has played a villainous role, having come back from the dead with a deal from Mephisto, who holds a uh, a pandemonium cube, which is, which like, is like a, a like demonic evil cosmic, cube? Do- cosmic cube. I love it. I love the, the evil that come hell from? cubes. But yeah, he uses the pandemonium cube to rewrite reality and get rid of the Avengers. Mm-hmm. And there's a great money shot, a literal money shot of the reveal of uh, in Mephisto we trust on their dollars. Which I thought was a great payoff. So good. And then, of course, every character says things like, oh, my Mephisto, or <laughs> for Mephisto's sake. For Mephisto's sake. You finally got your Mephisto payoff, nerds. It, 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 it seemed like a really screwed up society that's like this mom and apple pie and America first and they all worship Satan. Yeah. Wonder what kind <laughs> of relevance that could have. I wonder what, what kind of fingers it's pointing at day-to-day things. So <laughs> the the final issue comes down to a, a battle over Wakanda where you've got a Coulson is in his little flying car with his little evil red cube and <laughs> Captain America <laughs> smacking him around. And uh, the Coulson s- is in full-fledged supervillain mode. Yeah. He, uh, he turns Reed Richards into a, a stretchy pile of grossness and Ben Grimm into a pile of rocks. And he's yeah. shooting people in the head and burning people alive. He's, he's cackling mad. He's like, I did it. I made my perfect America. Poor Coulson. And so what a touch that I really loved of this is that uh, they retcon that Hyperion's planet is a source of vibranium. Yeah. I so it, vibranium I is his kryptonite. And yeah. Oh, and there's a great bit where he and Nighthawk are like, when we're together, Nothing we're the most, stop us. yeah, exactly. We're the most, like the greatest team in the world. And I was like, oh, the world's finest action. Yeah. And then Black Panther's like, no. And just solos both of them. Yeah. Loved it. I love a good Black Panther moment. Jason Aaron, he wrote a three issue Black Panther secret invasion tie-in when secret invasion was happening. And it's awesome. It's the best part of that event called See Wakanda and Die. I skipped over that one. It rules. I was so wrapped up in the fact that Spider-Woman was not only a Skrull, but the Queen (laughs) Skrull. And that uh, apparently Spider-Woman never came back. I know. The only thing that could have been more for you is if Sabretooth was the King Skrull. Oh, jeez. But yeah. uh, Other fun bit I really enjoy. Obviously, the Avengers saved the day. and uh, Yeah. They get everything fixed. And Blade's like, damn, I guess because I was a vampire, I remembered stuff. It seems so random to bring Blade into the forefront like this. I love it. I, that's what got me reading Jason Aaron's Avengers was Blade being like, hey, let's go to Transylvania and beat up Dracula. 
I need some backup. He's yeah, got. I his, need to beat up some Draculas. Dracula got a team of super vampires, and I need my own crew. When I heard that the vampires were all gone, I figured maybe this world had uh, developed, executed, and stuck with the Monesti formula. Do you remember this? Yeah, it's from Two Dracula. Yeah, well, I mean, like for a very long time, very long time in Marvel, there were no vampires yeah. because Doctor Strange did the Monesti formula, and it's annihilated every <laughs> single vampire. That's so why Dracula for the last ten issues was just like, "Oh no, I'm mortal." Yeah, I mean, they, I, I I remember reading the issue where it happened. Uh, I, you know, we're getting off topic. Yeah. We'll get back to that later. So, uh, there was a oh, I, I forgot to mention it earlier. The Power Princess Focus issue where uh, they put they fold in doing stuff like the three Thors story with Gore the God Butcher. She's like the worst out of all of them. Yeah. Power Princess is a bloodthirsty maniac. and Who created the Civil War because she was bored. Yeah. She was just like, eh, I've seen Nighthawk and Hyperion fight. I make them do another war if I want to. Yeah. You know, yeah. she's just here. You know, she's not here for a long time. She's here for a good time. Mm -hmm. And she just wants to. She has a little offhand reference to uh, having killed magic. Yeah. Where she's like, oh, yeah, where's the, the sword I got from killing that little demon princess? Forged from the, the metal of her brother. <laughs> Gnarly. That is pretty. I would have I would like to see that. Yeah. And then, of course, and Thor wakes up at the end of it, and he's like, she's like, oh, the Norse gods. Oh, those are all dead. Cool. And he's wearing the classic 80s and 70s Nor yeah. Thor he's, he's got stuff. his curry boots on. Yeah, he's even got the tiger stripe. That's very on. cute. Where do they come up with the tiger stripe boots? I'll we'll never, never know. But the day is saved. Uh, the Squadron Supreme are back in the main universe, but under very the watchful eye of the U.S. government. Thoroughly bitch slapped and demoralized. I don't remember where Coulson winds up. Uh, he gets like no, he gets put in, back in hell. Yeah. Oh, that's right. And we'll talk about the uh, the lasting effects of this after our next section, the tie-ins. Like any good event comic, there are a million tie-ins here. And uh, thankfully they're all one-shots and they are completely optional. There is not a single key thing in any of these, but I wanted to highlight three of them that I particularly enjoyed. I only read one of these. Yeah, exactly. So good thing you, I picked one of the ones that you liked. It's a good thing. <laughs> so my favorite one was uh, Marvel Double Action, The Night Sam Wilson Died which with playing with the Spider-Man, Batman mythos mashup does uh, the night when Stacy died with a death in the family. Yeah. Where Sam Wilson is the Robin to Nighthawk's Batman. Got a bird themed sidekick. A serious bird. Theme. And Tim Seeley and Dan Jurgens absolutely nail the feel of a 1970s Marvel comic. Dan Jurgens already got a pretty old school art style, but they put in some classic flat coloring in there and it's beautiful, gorgeous. I didn't get a chance to actually read this. So, so did they use the coloring style that they used back when they were doing newsprint? You know, when they would try to mix two colors and it would be like dots. They don't colors. have the dot matrix going, but I, I just mean more of it is smooth, flat colors. There's no like obnoxious shade, over shading and over texturing yeah, with they, them. They, they computer it's shading. Just, yeah, these nice solid figures. And you've got uh, my favorite detail on it is do you remember the little one line advertisements they'd have at the bottom of pages? Yeah. Like, uh, Green Lantern fights the Earth in Green Lantern 57 on sale now. Yeah. And stuff like that. They've got those throughout for like fake titles that don't exist. I could have done it for like the ads. This, this, this continues after the second page. And there's a letters column too. That's all. Oh, wow. It's, it's really fun. I, I really, really enjoyed it. And, uh, one that you, the one that you read, Siege One Society, read. is a Masters of Evil book. Yeah, that's uh, imagine it was like it was like kind of a Masters of Evil slash Brotherhood of Evil Mutants. Yeah, yeah. With uh, one one detail I liked was the uh, not all of them obviously because there's a ton of them, mm -hmm. but the most famous Avengers who are reform villains, Hawkeye, Black Widow, and Scott Lang yeah. are all members. So that was a fun detail. That without the Avengers, they stay criminals. Yeah, and they got the the Silver Witch, which is Quicksilver and Scarlet mm -hmm. Witch mashed together. You got Sabretooth, we your did. boy. You got Baron Zemo leading, of course. And uh, they tried to do a heist on a squad on a squadron base that doesn't go super well for them. I I and when I read this and I saw Sabretooth on the cover, I was like, okay, well, this is an alternate universe, and they're using Sabretooth. He's not in a hole. 
I, I can almost guarantee he's going to get killed in this book because Marvel really loves doing that. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's like, yeah, we've got an alter uh, savior. We're going to completely fry him, poke his eyes out or electrify him somehow. Because uh, that's what they did in X-Men Forever. Was that storm blind him by blowing his eyes out with lightning. Nasty. Mm-hmm. But yeah, this issue had a really high body count because you lo- Sabretooth dies. Did Scott Lang die? I think so, yeah. Scott dies. Zemo gets... Uh, he doesn't die, but he gets the ever loved snot kicked out of him. Yeah, he does. Uh, oh, what's his name? The Aquaman analog. Merman or something? Aquarian? Oh, I totally forgot who it was. The fish guy dies. Mm-hmm. Tom Thumb lives. Golden Archer lives. Yeah. But there's still... A, a pretty sizable chunk. I was like, oh, wow, they're really blowing through these team members, huh? Did they call him Golden Archer? I think they did call him Golden they Archer. They do, yeah. He's because got, wearing the Black Archer outfit. He's got that McDonald's pun. Yeah. Because he's a capitalist. Yeah, because I remember the, the, the Grunwald story, he went from Golden Archer to Black Archer. The Black Archer outfit looked really cool. It was pretty sick. Yeah. But you got to have that Mickey D's reference. Yep. And uh, third for me is uh, Peter Parker... The Amazing Shutterbug, or as I like to call it, Hyperion's pal, Peter Parker. You and your Jimmy Olsen. I, I will I, never understand your Jimmy Olsen I love fascination. Jimmy. I'm a big Jimmy fan. Where does this come from? They're fun stories. And did you have like a fundamental part where you're like, yay, hero. And you like, you just identified with it? I don't know. I, I, I mean, I love Superman Man series as a kid, and he's a yeah. fun character there. Uh, I think, well, probably went around when I was in junior high or high school is when I first started I found a couple of them like in a dollar bin of like old Silver Age Jimmy Olsen's. And I was like, this is hilarious. I Did you ever this. have like dreams that you were Superman's pal? <laughs> I mean, I'd rather be Superman's pal than Superman because. Yeah, no that, that's a lot of responsibility. Exactly. But I get to be around and enjoy the hijinks. Yeah. But anyways, uh, <laughs> Peter Parker's not really Hyperion's pal in it. No, he's perceived in his own way that he thinks that he's Hyperion's pal, but he's just kind of no, like, eh. no. He hates Hyperion's guts. Does he? Yeah, because Hyperion, I didn't is, this, Hyperion is responsible for the death of Aunt May, because Aunt May goes to uh, buy her, her her nephew a graduation present at the mall, and then Hyperion does a flying elbow through the mall, <laughs> and just pew kills everyone inside. Yeah. And how's Hyperion feel about this? Uh, Hyperion doesn't care. He's like, yeah, I stopped I stopped a supervillain. I kept America safe. He pulled an A-train. Yeah. And so oh my God. Peter Parker then is like, I got to become a journalist and I got to keep tabs on this guy, but I'm going to be all golly gee to you know, win him oh, over. Oh, so it's an act. It's an act. And Hyperion, it doesn't really work. Hyperion mostly just kind of takes pity on him and is like, yeah, sure, I'll let you take some pictures of me, weirdo. But Peter's like, yeah, I'm getting in good. And it's a really tragic story because you've got Peter's basically taking care of Uncle Ben, who's just like kind of like just catatonically depressed after Aunt May died. Yeah. And Pete's doing okay at the photography thing, but he winds up having to like give his life to save the Daily Bugle because you remember in uh, Heroes Reborn, there's a little passing reference to the Annihilation Wave being kept in a little miniaturized bottle. And Peter even says, like, if one of those gets loose, like, it could destroy the entire New York economy. Yeah. <laughs> and so one does get loose. And Peter's able to evacuate the Daily Bugle building, but he gets infected by the drone. And so he jumps out the window to save the world. There's even a little bit of, like... Peter was a hero. He yeah. was. He was a sweet boy. A, he turned into a gross buggy boy when he hit the pavement. But, uh... yeah. But it was a really good issue. Uh, shout out to Mark Bernadine. Really, really talented scriptwriter there. So Coles is in a cube. Reality is fixed. But the story ain't over. Because Jason Aaron ain't off Avengers yet. Nope. Uh, and we got crap loads of Mephisto to go. We do. We've got a whole lot more Mephisto because he's in his little puppy dog form. And he's like, hmm, Coulson, you, you fool. This is just a small bump in the road for my master plan. And me and the other 615 Mephistos. Yeah, so they've got the Council of Red, and he's got a whole multiverse array of Mephistos. Yeah, they just all happen to count up to 616. And they got all their little pandemonium cubes, and they're they're ready to cause some trouble. I'm excited to see where that goes. Yeah. I, I dive in and out of uh, Jason Aaron's Avengers because it, weird, it, it, it swings wildly from... Exactly my kind of stupid to just plain stupid. <laughs> so I'll be like, 
Oh man, Blade's the sheriff of Vampire Town? Awesome. The Phoenix Force is Thor's mom? Stupid. Yeah. But uh, the other lasting consequence that's going to be leading into the Avengers is that uh, little baby Starbrand is now a little toddler Starbrand. He's got a little baby Yoda egg. Yeah, uh, apparently that was a reference that I didn't quite catch that was happening in Avengers before this happened. Yeah, so there was a little little Starbrand baby born oh. on the other side of space. When she was born, she blew up a bunch of bunch of ships, and the Shi'ar are going to get her. You know, we completely glossed over the fact that Rocket Raccoon was essentially Lobo. Yeah, Lobo Rocket Raccoon got killed by uh, Doc Spectrum, and that was rad. And how about the fact that he had a maggot gun? It was gnarly. <laughs> so, so rad. But, uh, yeah, so little little baby, baby Starbrand is now big Starbrand, and I still don't really care about Starbrand, so. Uh, well. Try as Jim Shooter might. New Universe just isn't going to stick. It's never going to happen. Well, I mean, I can understand why they're trying to put Starbrand where he is, because, I mean, Starbrand was like a cosmic thing, even way back in the New Universe issues. Yeah. And you couldn't ignore it. And when they brought New Universe kind of back during mm-hmm. the whole Quasar run, that means the Star Brand is now in the Marvel <laughs> Universe. You have to now deal with it. Do you, though? I've spent my entire life perfectly comfortable pretending Star Brand doesn't exist. God, you know, one of these days we need to talk and making, about Quasar. making Caveman Star Brand be the Hulk was really dumb. That was a little over top. And uh, speaking of, uh, there's been a couple of books lately that have felt like, Marvel creative teams eating other Marvel creative teams' lunch in mm. terms of just dunking on them. Uh, <laughs> Immortal Hulk: Time of Monsters, where you see the first prehistoric Hulk, was one of the best one shots I've read this year. I haven't seen that one. Up. Way better than dumb caveman Starbrand Hulk. What the Avengers one million BC? Yeah, God. Every time there's a million one, Avengers one million BC thing, I, I hop out of Aaron's run. I'm like, nope. That's the one with the uh, Ghost Rider riding a mammoth, if I'm not mistaken. Which is the best part of that, but <laughs> it's also is that is that the right amount of stupid? Yeah, exactly. Okay. Jason Aaron, oh, that was I forgot. I can't believe I forgot to mention this. My favorite thing Jason Aaron did. He did an awesome Ghost Rider run in the 2000s mm-hmm. that had such great bits as uh, Master Pandemonium trying to eat, but his baby hands punching him. <laughs> so he's like, "Please let me eat," and they're like, "No." I've always kind of characterized. Uh, Ghost Rider runs with how they treated Danny Ketch. Danny Ketch is treated with a ton of respect in his run. That's the way it should be. Yeah. The, he, and, he and Johnny Blaze are like co-ghost writers in it. This is the way I've always viewed it. Uh, as far as you, you, we have a mutual respect for Wally West. Yeah, he's, he's, he's Wally the West Wally West of the Marvel Universe. Yeah. He came up around the same time, uh, ultimately sur- surpassed the original, I would say. Yeah, he's a second stringer that became... The guy. The guy. That everybody wanted versus, you know, boring ass Barry Allen I, and boring ass Johnny I, I'll Blaze. say this. Johnny Blaze is a lot more interesting than Barry Allen. But he's, he's still motorcycle boring. man. Johnny Blaze is still boring. I My very first comic was a Ghost Rider comic. And even back then I realized, this guy's kind of boring. Yeah, old school Johnny Blaze, but he's got that Nick Cage cred now. All right, we're getting the uh, the light from our producer that we need to start wrapping this up. So I guess so, we should uh, uh, bring it immediate, home. Yeah, immediately the next thing in Avengers is going to be... Uh, Though, a win- like a, a Red Room story, since they introduced a vampire Black Widow with the vampire stuff. And we're going to get the Winter Hulk, so we'll see if character mashups keep paying off dividends for Jason Aaron. Yeah, I think my really big concluding thought for this whole thing is that I think this is a successful experiment in a new way to do an event comic. Which is, get six issues done weekly, and... Do us a couple one shots to every week to accommodate it, and then you're done. You're in and out. It's fine. The big problem I think that came with it is you mentioned the continuity error is in having a different artist for each issue, and when they're all releasing one week, one week, one week, that mm-hmm. doesn't leave a lot of time to correct stuff. And you know, that's not really the artist's fault. That's editorial. That, yeah, that is a definitely an editorial issue and should have been caught. Beforehand. One mistake, forgivable. Three mistakes. That's editorial not doing its job. And Hellfire Gala, some, kind of a similar, the X-Men events have been also weekly affairs. Mm-hmm. And I think this is how we should do the event comic moving forward instead of having a nine-month Leviathan. That or having gets, the summer thing be actually three months yeah, long. Exactly. Just keep it contained. Because when you're having a book that's like 12 issues and takes six months plus, de- plus delays to tell, plus a bunch of unnecessary miniseries tie-ins, it's just... 
it's completely unwieldy and financially impossible to keep up with. This, however, it was just seven core issues plus I think about two tie-ins a week. So maybe 14 tie-ins total that are completely ancillary and only serve to expand things you might be interested in. So say- And it's like, strangely easy to digest very quickly. Yeah. it Because I marathon this uh, overnight. Exactly. This- <laughs> This should be the standard. Let's let's do more of this, Marvel. Mm-hmm. Agreed. And uh, I think with that, we just do uh, our regular plugs. Check out our socials. We've got def- we got the Facebook, we got the Insta, we got sometimes we got the Twitters. Sometimes we got the Twitters. Uh, when I decide to twit things, give me the money on the Patreon. Uh, and uh, check out our Hellfire Gala coverage in our last episode. Subscribe, like, all that good jazz. Maybe even dislike us. Who knows? Yeah, Be honest with us. We, we get that tone sometimes. This is the way it goes. And uh, we'll see you guys next time. <laughs>